maybe YouTube isn't for me anymore. I had my first internet beef in 2023 and I'm gonna tell you the real story. Someone also accused me of stealing their content. Get a drink, a tea, a beer, some water. Let's have a casual episode. What's up marketers? I always feel a little nostalgic in December because it's also my birthday and I just feel like with the new year and the holiday season in January, I really step into a new life cycle. And this year I had a ton of changes. I quit my agency job, became a full-time creator slash consultant, and I also disappeared from the internet for two months. So let's dive into the seven lessons that I learned in 2023. And we're gonna start off with a really juicy one. Number one, maybe create creator life isn't actually for me. So I went full-time creator July 1st, 2023. I quit my agency job. It was really a long time coming and I do have a video that's going to be coming out soon that goes into the reasons why I quit my job and what it's like being a full-time creator. But suffice it to say that I'm really grappling with trying to decide whether or not I want to do this full-time creator life or if, you know, I don't really know what else. I really built this channel and a lot of my career on being a career advertiser. I really loved the hustle and bustle of working with agencies and working directly with brands and founders and just doing YouTube or just doing content while I do really enjoy it. I feel like I'm almost a little bit too far away from a lot of the work and I'm used to having hundreds and hundreds of accounts at my access. And while I do a little bit of consulting with brands right now, I just, you know, I'm trying to decide like, hey, do I wanna do this full-time creator thing or do I wanna be more of a consultant? I don't know. I'm still trying to figure that out and uh well, stay tuned. <laughs> the second thing that I want to see is I really do think that nearly anyone could be a successful creator in 2024. And it's really funny. Some of my friends who are successful creators, full-time successful creators, they're pretty average people. The only thing that makes them not average, in my opinion, is that they took the first step to actually start making content and they continually put themselves out there even when there's a lot of negative feedback, there's friction. I just don't think that a lot of people see how attainable actually being a creator and making money online via their content, how accessible that is. And what I will say is I think that oftentimes content creation, especially on YouTube, looks like a young man's game. But in reality, it's really for everyone. And I really want to encourage, especially more women to get into the forefront, especially in this niche and begin sharing their ideas and their perspective, because I think the advertising industry really, really needs it. Number three, if you are good at your job, at content, whatever, people are going to replicate you. So I'm gonna talk about my first internet beef, which happened earlier this year. So I made this tweet, which is a little off the cuff. I was also just being a little cheeky, whatever. Anyways, the creator then made this video and quote unquote retaliation. And it taught me a lot because number one, I realized, okay, the more that you kind of feed into these things, even if it's just really casual and not really serious like it, it, it like people have a right to respond and and I think I was like a little taken aback by like wow like you know people are actually paying attention to like what I'm saying what I'm doing and like they care about my perspective on that on some level I knew that but I think I was still surprised to see it and the reason why I even made that post in the first place is because I had recently saw that creator had been taking a lot of the hooks and video ideas that I was doing on TikTok and even boiling down to the exact type of font and text that I was using which they were not using previously and I was just kind of like am I going to accuse them of stealing my content not really, but I did think it was really interesting to see, wow, like, is that how people are getting ahead in the content game by just like learning from what other people are doing and then replicating it, but not like really replicating it in their own way well enough. I, I don't know. And number one, it made me realize that like, okay, the more that I, content that I put out there, the more like good work that I do, that's just, there's just going to be more of that. And I have to be okay with that. And I am. And I also feel like in some ways I have to encourage it because I do want people out there making their own content and putting their own POV on, on things. But yeah, I just felt like that whole thing was a learning moment. And it also was like, huh, it, it, it like made me grapple with my own process because I actually do not watch content from my competitors, especially on on YouTube. So yeah, even though I'm friends with Charlie and I'm friends with Alex Cooper, like I'm not actually watching the content that they put out because I don't want to subconsciously repeat things and position something as mine when it's not. And, and I really do try to like stay in my lane and not borrow too much from outside sources unless it's, you know, from the brands that are putting out content. And then I want to like talk about that content. So yeah, like I, I had actually wondered, like maybe I should like try and like 
take some of the learnings that some of my competitors are doing and apply them to my own videos or to, to my own whatever. And I actually did this in a recent thumbnail test and it worked and I'm just kind of like, ah, I'm not sure, you know. Anyways, I think that no matter what, if you're good, like people are gonna replicate it. And that's actually just a positive indicator of what you're doing. Number four less positive. Um, the more that you are public and the more that you position yourself as an expert, AKA get more eyeballs, the more that people are just gonna have it out for you in general. And that's just a part of the game, a part of making content, a part of being a public persona. So very interestingly, especially when considering my last lesson, I had someone recently accuse me of stealing some of their content. Spoiler, I didn't. I had never actually seen any of the materials that they were supplying as proof for something that I had stolen and also the thing that they were accusing me of stealing their chat GPT prompts. Like, I, yeah, and, and very average ones at that because I don't really think I'm the expert on that kind of stuff. Whatever. Out of the 2 million views that I've had on YouTube, the 61K followers on TikTok, the 50K subscribers on YouTube, yay for us. I only feel like a handful of people have really like had it out for me and like had me in, in their sights as like someone they don't want to see succeed. And to be honest, like, I'm just gonna kind of take those odds every day because I feel like I've spread a lot more good in the world. And even though I, some people have it out for me, I have to learn personally how to not pay that as much mind. Um, I think I'm, I'm definitely a recovering people pleaser. And that's something that I have been working on a lot to not try and make everyone happy. And I think especially if you do content, that's something that is, it's like a practice you have to do every day and it's really hard to do. But yeah, honestly, like a handful of people out of like 2 million views. I'll take those odds every fucking day. The fifth thing that I learned is like to pay for support and to pay for it early. Um, sure, I can answer all of my emails and I can do all the invoicing and, and do all the menial backends operational bullshit and notion, but especially for creators, I've learned how much the cognitive load of doing menial tasks that I don't actually have to do actually weighs on me a lot. Um, I am definitely like a high level strategic person and I'm very good at talking to people one-on-one. -on -one. I'm also very good to, at making content and talking to a broader group of people and explaining complex subjects. What I'm not good at doing is answering emails and slacks on time, following really, really strict deadlines, just like the menial like things that need to get done. Like that kind of stuff is a little bit soul crushing for me. And I've learned that it's a lot better for me ultimately to pay for that support so that I don't have the cognitive load of those menial tasks, which I think is especially especially important for more creative people or more strategic people because the operational backend stuff, um, yeah, sure, you can do it. You can do it all day and you could even probably just take an hour or two out of your day to do all that kind of stuff. But sometimes I know that for creatives and especially myself, like I need to have space in my day to just be and to, you know, allow myself to, to play and like think about things in a fun way and like explore and research. And I need to like pay for support to lighten my cognitive load. I said, how many times am I going to say cognitive load in this? <laughs> and number six is a much more positive one. I think ultimately people do want to help. Um, Nick Shackelford has an excellent quote that I'm sure he stole from somewhere else, which is closed mouths don't get fed. And something that I have learned and thought about a lot is just like the more that I share with people what kind of help that I need and what I'm looking for, the more people that are number one, looking out for ways, even just casually to help me out. Um, but also just like, we have a great community and especially even though like D2C Twitter is sort of, um, it can be an awful place. It can also be like a really positive place. And it's where I, even though it's one of my smaller platforms, it's often the first place that I go if I realize, hey, I need help on a video or I need some type of new perspective or I wanna collaborate on something and I really appreciate that and I've been trying to ask for help more when I need it because contrary to like a belief that I had before like no one does things by themselves and no one gets a gold medal for doing things just as you and honestly like I've found that I'm able to do a lot more when I have support so just something to consider <laughs> 
Number seven, people wanna hear the bold thing. And especially businesses, if they're hiring you as a media buyer or consultant, they value your POV, your honesty, and straightforward communication. Something I struggled with as a young media buyer was a lot of times I would get feedback from a client and I would just try to appease them and make them happy or try to do a strategy that they wanted because they thought it was best. And something that I've been doing a lot more this year, especially in my consultancy life, is I realized that the reason why business are hiring me is because they want to hear the hard thing and I am going to give it back to them. So if Facebook ad results are falling off of a cliff or they're having a hard time scaling past a certain point, if I look at the account and I don't see anything egregiously wrong with the account or the creative, I normally just turn it back on the business and I'm like, listen, I don't think that you're going to be able to scale to X, Y, and Z. And a lot of it has to do with your products, your own cogs. And that's not really on the media buying. And I'm, I'm honest with them. I'm like, you know what? Like you could hire a, t like, you know, you could hire a few media buyers or a few agencies to, you know, fiddle around and try to make things work. But at the end of the day, you're just going to end up cycling through a whole bunch of people. And what I think that is interesting about moving to the 2024, I think that now a lot of brands and agencies are starting to realize, hey, you know, what, we're not gonna be able to hack our way to success and we have to look at the overall business and business structure to see if it's actually worth scaling. Now, in the same way that I'm kind of a hard ass when communicating with businesses about all the things they're doing wrong, I'm also way more honest with myself and with businesses about when I think I do things that are not as good. I actually had an instance earlier this year, this is before I went full time where I was working with a business and I ended up doing a big presentation for them. And honestly, it just like wasn't my best work and I wasn't proud of it and I walked away from that being like, oh yeah, that was a little rough. And it was funny because I had ended up talking to the POC on that client account maybe a week or two later. And they were like, how do you think that went? And I was like, honestly, not my best work. Here are all the things that I think that could have went way better. And here are the things that I was hoping to get from your team that I didn't. But honestly, I take that all on me. And you know, here are the reasons why I made these decisions. And it was a big learning experience because X, Y, Z. And honestly, the client was like, Wow, number one, I didn't think it was that bad, but I really appreciate you giving me that insight. And he, because he was like, you know, I also thought the conversation was off, but I thought it was off from our side. And being able to hear it from like how I saw it, he was able to see maybe where both parties could have came together in a better way. So as much as I am trying to be more honest and straightforward with brands about what they could be doing, I'm also more honest and straightforward with myself and with others about where I think my true strengths and weaknesses lie. Just I think that t things tend to move a lot better when you are a quote unquote straight shooter. And the last one, eight or seven, I'm not really sure at this point. This is something I learned a lot in my personal life. And I don't talk much about my personal life online. And that's definitely not something that I'm going to be doing moving forward. But I did have a really big personal learning experience this year in which had a trickle down effect to me and my business, which is that I think the stories that we tell ourselves are the ones that are the most important. Even casual narratives, even casual assumptions that I have about people, about businesses, about relationships, whatever. I realized that a lot of the stories I was telling myself about myself in even about others really had a bit of a catastrophic effect on me this year. I know this is very, you know, obscure and I'm purposefully making it obscure, but I realized that, you know, the stories that I tell about myself are like the most important and how I'm positioning myself and the narrative of myself and the way that I see myself is really incredibly important. And it kind of becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy. And essentially like what I really realized is like, I kind of have to like be Delulu for myself, <laughs> you know, to borrow what, like what my younger cousins are saying. Like I realized that like, you know, when I was going through my burnout and I was having this really tough time and I was like, oh, like, I don't know if I'm doing the right thing, blah, blah, blah. Like the more that I sort of sank into that um, confusion and that burnout and that stress, the more that that just created this like hamster wheel effect on me. And when I was able to shake things up and really make some bold decisions and you know, some of them worked, some of them didn't, but I was able to like really quickly alter my path. That's when I realized that like I had started telling a much different narrative about myself in my head. And that was really important. This is a very woo woo video. I hope it was enjoyable. It um, kind of just seemed like a gossip session for myself, which I hope you enjoyed. Anyways, I will see you in the new year. I'm really excited about the next video, which are going to be my 2024 predictions. Yay. Can you relate to this? Be sure to leave a like and subscribe.